And in this UU congregation, we are people of differing beliefs and identities, privileged, marginalized, and intersecting. We believe in celebrating our theological differences and our philosophical differences. At the beginning of our worship services on Sundays, we have a call and response in which we speak aloud that we are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We believe in living out our UU faith by committing to social justice matters like the climate crisis, LGBTQ plus equal equity, and confronting racism in ourselves and in our world. And this is where tonight's topic comes in. On June 24th, the Supreme Court of the United States issued its decision in the Dobbs versus Jackson's Women Health Organization case, which overturns Roe versus Wade, upending nearly 50 years of access to abortion. In telling you why we're here tonight and where BUC comes in, I want to quote parts of a statement by Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray, president of our Unitarian Universalist Association, regarding the court's decision. Reverend Gray says, this decision manifests the worst fears of those of us who have been working for decades to protect and affirm reproductive rights. The overwhelming majority of Unitarian Universalists support keeping abortion legal in all or most cases. This is rooted in our principles and our core religious beliefs that affirm gender equity. It also reflects a moral commitment to the idea that reproductive care is health care and is essential to the well being of individuals and families. Unitarian Universalists are committed to reproductive justice, a framework created by Black women in the 1980s and 1990s, which affirms the right to have children, not to have children, to parent the children one has in healthy environments, to safeguard bodily autonomy, and to express one's sexuality freely. The UU faith has a long history of collaborating in this movement and advocating for safe, legal, accessible abortion care." End quote. So that, in a nutshell, is why we're here. Our three speakers will be engaging in a discussion, moderated by me, about the various facets of this new reality in which safe and easily accessible abortion care is at risk. Our speakers will all be bringing their specific expertise and background to bear on this conversation, tied together in the common ground of Unitarian Universalism. Now for some housekeeping. This event is being recorded and will be posted later to a couple of BUC's online platforms. We are using a webinar format, which means that only the speakers and myself will be seen and heard. All audience members will be muted at all times, and as you can see, audience video thumbnails will not be visible. Chat is disabled, but during the Q&A portion of the event, audience members will be able to submit questions via the Q&A box. Questions will be addressed at the discretion of the moderator, and abusive, threatening, inappropriate, or derogatory language of any kind will result in removal from the webinar. Speaking of language, I also want to mention that this is a topic for which the use of inclusive language comes into play. We promote the use of inclusive language and during this discussion, certain terms will be used interchangeably and each speaker will be using the words they feel comfortable with. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers in the order in which we'll be hearing from them. First is the Honorable Marilyn Kelly. Justice Kelly is a longtime member of Birmingham Unitarian Church. In her career, she served as a justice on the Michigan Supreme Court for 16 years, and before that was a judge of the Michigan Court of Appeals. Earlier, she was in the, in the private practice of law and a teacher of French in the public schools. Today, she is the distinguished jurist in residence at Wayne State University Law School, where she has established a scholarship for students interested in public service law and she teaches a class in Access to Justice aimed at encouraging graduate, graduates to serve those not able to access or afford legal help. Welcome, Marilyn. Next up is Julia Pulver. Julia is a lifelong UU political activist and registered nurse. Julia graduated with her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Western Michigan University with a minor in biology. 
Julia earned her Master of Science in Nursing with a specialization in nursing leadership and administration from Capella University. Julia has extensive experience in all areas of healthcare, including intensive care units, hospital administration, value-based reimbursement, quality improvement, and public health policy. Julia is the co-founder and managing partner of HPS Consulting LLC, a healthcare consulting firm based in Detroit. Our third speaker this evening is the Reverend Mandy Beal. Reverend Mandy is the senior minister of Birmingham Unitarian Church. She is convinced that human life is sacred and bodily autonomy is a prerequisite of justice. She is deeply grounded in the belief that liberation and salvation are interchangeable terms. Furthermore, both exist only in the realm of the collective, not as an individual status. In other words, there is no salvation for one if there is no liberation for all. Welcome to our three panelists. With that, we are ready to begin our discussion and I'll turn it over to the Honorable Marilyn Kelly to start us off. Thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna say a few words about the state of the law in Michigan today, now that Roe has been struck down for the purpose of laying a foundation for the rest of our discussions tonight. What happened is that the court by a five to four decision struck down precedent, which as we know has existed ever since 1973. It's significant that the decision was a bare majority. Had only one of those five chosen to go the other way, Roe would be alive today. It's significant also that the Chief Justice, Justice Roberts, a conservative justice, did not vote to strike down Roe v. Wade and cautioned and urged his colleagues on the conservative end of the court to go with him in exercising what he said was judicial restraint. And he said, we should decide only the issue that's before us and that's the constitutionality of a Mississippi 15 year abortion ban and not go beyond it and talk about Roe v. Wade at all. It wasn't necessary, he said, to resolve the case and judicial restraint would require that we not go beyond it. Um, but obviously they did and in so doing overturned precedent. Now let me say a few words about precedent. Precedent basically is, and this is a, a quote from Justice Gorsuch, who signed the opinion. Precedent is a way of accumulating and passing down the learning of past generations, a font of established wisdom richer than what can be found in any single judge or panel of judges. The purpose of adhering to precedent, keeping the law, the established law in place and not overturning it is to provide stability in the law, dependability, so we all know what the rules are and that we can abide by them. It restrains what you might call judicial hubris or arrogance. It encourages respect for the law um, by justices on the court um, for, for law that was established by past justices on the court. It reduces endless litigation challenging precedent and it fosters even-handed decision-making. Strictly speaking, the rules for when precedent should be overturned are that the case that's, that might be overturned is not workable, that there's been no concrete reliance on the decision in that case by the people or, or, or other or, or legal um, establishments, that, uh, that, that uh, overturning it would not have a disrupted, disruptive effect on the law or on society, and that it wouldn't undermine respect for the law and for the court, for the Supreme Court, which in polls in past years has, has been found to be more respected by the people than the uh, uh, Congress and the president, whoever was there. Um, It'll be interesting to see what the next poll shows with respect to public confidence and respect for the court. In any event, Roe and Casey were overturned. And where does that leave us then as to the state of the law in Michigan regarding abortion? Well, we've had a law on the books since 1931, which actually was based on a law that was passed in 1846 
which makes abortion illegal in Michigan. And uh, it would have been in effect all these years, was it not for Roe v. Wade. Um, right now, that law is not enforceable because it's been stayed through an injunction issued by a court of claims judge, Judge Gleischer. She issued that decision in a, a, in, a, in a case that was filed by Planned Parenthood with the assistance of the ACLU. Um, and that case not only seek, sought to enjoin or prevent the enforcement of the 1931 law, it sought to make a determination that the law is unconstitutional because under Michigan law, under Michigan constitutional law, there is a right to abortion. That's the assertion in the case, and that's what's before the court. At the same time, interestingly, that this case was filed by a, a Planned Parenthood, another lawsuit was filed, this time by the governor of the state of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. Whitmer sued Emmett County Prosecutor Lindemer, Lindemann and 12 other county prosecutors uh, for the purpose of getting a determination from the Supreme Court, similar to the determination sought in the Planned Parenthood case, that that 1931 statute is unconstitutional and that the Michigan Constitution does provide a right for abortion. It's um, interesting that some prosecutors have actually sided with Dana Nessel in insisting that they will not enforce the 1931 law, even if it does become viable in Michigan. Of course, we can't depend on that happening. And there are 83 counties in Michigan. Everyone has a prosecutor and other prosecutors have been silent on what they would do if that 1931 law went into effect in Michigan. So um, we have a situation where the Michigan Supreme Court ultimately will be deciding the constitutionality of that law and also whether the Michigan law provides uh, con uh, the right to abortion. We don't know when the court will act on that. It could be that it, that it will act on it within coming months. It could be that it will wait until after the general election in November. Um, and all the while that this is going on, we have a third matter underway in Michigan evolving, involving abortion, which is not before the courts, but involves a people's initiative to amend the Michigan Constitution and to hold, and these are the words that are used there, every individual has a fundamental right to reproductive freedom, which entails the right to raise to make and effectuate decisions about all matters relating to pregnancy, including but not limited to prenatal care, childbirth, postpartum care, contraception, sterilization, abortion care, miscarriage management, and fertility care. And it goes on to say that in no circumstance shall the state prohibit an abortion that in the professional judgment of an attending healthcare professional is medically indicated to protect the life or the physical or mental health of the pregnant individual. You should note that there's no provision to protect a woman whose life is, uh, unless her life is at danger, there's no provision to protect her under the 1931 law uh, if she was made pregnant through a rape or an act of incest. That initiative is very likely to be on the ballot because there's been such a strong groundswell to support it that it now has turned in, I think over 200% of, of, the, of the signatures necessary to validly uh, pass muster with the, um, with the certification board. Uh, I think it, it will be challenged and heavily opposed, but I think we're gonna see it on the ballot in November. And of course, if that happened, then the constitutionality of abortion in Michigan would be exactly where it was when Roe v. Wade was alive, except it will only pertain to Michigan, of course. Uh, it will be as if we were restoring Roe, but with more actually in it, as I read to you, uh, than even Roe had at the time that it was overturned. So it makes for a very interesting situation. And uh, I think we're gonna know by the end of the calendar year for sure, whether abortion is legal in Michigan, 
whether we have the right to it under the Michigan Constitution, uh, whether that 1931 law is valid or invalid. Um, we're going to know whether it's a felony to perform an abortion in Michigan, which would be the case under that law, a four-year felony, or a misdemeanor to provide drugs uh, or to sell them or to even advertise them, providing a year in, in jail uh, under that 1931 law. Um, I think that also relevant to the state of law in Michigan uh, is the fact that we're gonna be electing new state legislators in November uh, with uh, under districts that are not gerrymandered. Now we're gonna be electing two justices of the Supreme Court. All of those people can have effect on what the law becomes in Michigan on the subject of abortion. So I'll cut it short there and go back to more of this as we continue our discussion. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, we're gonna go to Julia now for some uh, remarks about the healthcare landscape. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you to my fellow panelists and everybody who is joining us. I'm glad to see we have quite a bit of uh, uh, a long list of uh, attendees. Um, I really just want to drive home uh, the fact that when politicians write healthcare law, they do so based on a sort of fantasy they've concocted in their head of what it is that they're actually doing. And, you know, all of the rhetoric, all of the wording, everything that we have seen so far, um, you would think that the only, only things that are being impacted right now in a post row America um, are that abortion clinics, like standalone abortion clinics are shut down. And that's it, that's the only thing. And then maybe you have some, a harder time uh, you know, getting a medical abortion, um, you know, getting those pills prescribed to you if you live in a, in a dangerous state um, or that, uh, you know, some, something very far away that it's happening. Um, and, and like many things, if it doesn't directly involve you, you don't really quite grasp it. Um, and that's exactly what's happening right now. We are living in um, what seemed to be like a game of chicken between uh, the Supreme Court and now between state uh, legislatures and the medical community. And it's nobody, <laughs> you know, the, the, they just crashed. And we are in this very chaotic moment. Um, and, and that is leading to a very, very dangerous place for everyone, um, regardless of your status as um, a patient who would or would not be seeking uh, specific uh, abortion care. Um, and unfortunately, the, the cases are already starting to pile up of what I've been calling post-row harm. Um, very, very concrete examples of the chaos that has ensued because, you know, Doctors, nurses, um, you know, hospital administrators are not lawyers, right? We, we're, we don't know the law. We don't know exactly, um, you know, what can and cannot be done. We have protocols that we follow. We have evidence-based practice that we follow. Um, we, we do what we are trained to do, and that is to provide the best care possible to patients. And now, depending on what state you live in and what state you practice in, you're being barred from doing so. Um, and, and we're seeing very real cases, um, you know, especially with ectopic pregnancies. I think you've heard probably a lot about this. Um, though, for those of you who don't know, an ectopic pregnancy is when a fertilized egg implants anywhere outside the uterus. Most times that's going to be in the fallopian tube because um, fertilization actually happens. A lot of people think it happens in the uterus. It happens in the fallopian tube and then it travels down. And if it's going to become a pregnancy, it then has to implant into the side of the uterus. And that's without any sort of augmentation or um, you know, IVF or anything like that. If, if it's in just a, a you know, pregnancy that has no other intervention to it, that's how it happens. Those pregnancies are always doomed to fail. They're, they're not able to uh, you know, get the blood supply that they need. 
in order to survive um, into a full term, uh, you know, pregnancy and be delivered healthy. They, they're never going to survive. But so many of these states have now, uh, you know, just fully embraced this idea of, you know, no abortions whatsoever, except to save the life of the mother. Well, now doctors are having to make their patients wait until they are at the brink of death, that they're almost bleeding to death. Uh, if there's any cardiac activity, which there could be, um, before that they will they will save their lives. You know, there's a case coming out of Missouri where, you know, a woman was delayed for nine hours after it was established that she had an ectopic pregnancy that had ruptured um, because the ob Jin was on the phone with their legal department trying to figure out what they could and couldn't do at what point. And there are not any hard and fast rules about that because that is not good practice. That has never been good practice. Um, so we have politicians um, and judges now and justices of the Supreme Court dictating medical care. Um, and, and that is leading to very real harm. And, and it's also just, again, putting an enormous strain on our already strained healthcare systems. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember, but there was like this big pandemic that went around a couple years ago. Um, and hospitals and hospital resources were already pushed to the max. And now we have thrown another wrench into uh, standard operating procedures by forcing providers in all states, not just the dangerous states, the safe states now are the ones that are having to receive those patients. They're having to find room for those patients. You know, providers in Illinois are having to take patients from uh, Missouri and Iowa and anywhere else where they, you know, can't get a safe abortion or if they can't now, they will very soon because every Republican, you know, or anti-choice politician is just salivating at the idea of making their state the most hard line. And, and all that equates to is people being hurt and getting denied the care that they need. Um, also, people who have no interest in becoming pregnant whatsoever are being hurt as well. Um, the, the medications that are used to induce an abortion, um, like methotrexate, is also very commonly used for uh, conditions such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And so uh, patients who live in states that are hostile or that have had you know, um, all of their protections overturned, these doctors are now denying people who are of reproductive age and ability regardless again of any intention if they ever want to become pregnant or not they're denying them uh those prescriptions they're messing with their chronic conditions um, and their medication regimen because they could potentially become pregnant um and they don't want to give them that medication anymore so this is affecting patients across the board um regardless of their their desire to become pregnant or not um, and, and it's really just, it's another unnecessary harm that is being done, not because it was, uh, better for, you know, medical practice, right? It's, there were the trap laws that they tried to put in place and they were trying to say, oh, well, it's, we need to have bigger hallways and we need to have people who want a medication abortion, they need to come sit in this clinic and take these pills you know, in front of us because that's safer. Um, they used to pretend that all of the things that they were doing to chip away at Roe were for increased health and safety reasons. And we know of course, it, it was none of that. This is purely done on ideological, philosophical, religious basis um, and, and has no zero basis in any science or medical ethics um, or, or anything that is there to increase patient safety or improve outcomes. Um, so we'll get into more of it and I will go ahead and turn it over to the good Rev. Thank you, Julia. Oh man. So this is actually, I, I, 
I don't know if everybody knows, this was all Marilyn's idea. And I'm really excited <laughs> to, to get into this tonight. Um, I was really glad when Marilyn approached me and said, you know, we really should probably do something. And I was glad uh, to have Julia's partnership in this as, as well. Um, you know, Julia with an understanding of how the politic and works and then also as a, as a nurse. Um, and Sarah, thank you so much as our new director of congregational life for um, your moderation tonight. I also want to mention that there's this silent D down here. That's David Yurasek, our, our new AV coordinator who is, is here as our bouncer tonight for uh, anyone who gets um, inappropriate, David will, will be taking you out. Uh, so why are we doing this? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I just, there's so much to be said ab about this topic. Um, and I wanna just, you know, we've all kind of given our, you know, who we are and why we're here. So I just, I'm not sure who all is here tonight because we're using the webinar feature, which I think is the way to go, but I can't see, so I don't know. So I'm just gonna tell you. Uh, Unitarian Universalism is a liberal religion that has roots stretching back across centuries and continents, but is very heavily influenced by um, specifically American liberal contextual theologies of the late 20th century on. We're not new, but our theology is ever evolving. That's kind of the, the thing that we're going for. So we have history, we have theologies that we draw from that are ancient, um, but, our, but our whole goal is to be current. And, and present, right? And that's what a liberal religion is, the belief that religion is a, a dynamic force rather than something static. And as such, Unitarian Universalists are not beholden to a creedal statement or to a set of doctrines. Instead, we are expected to develop our own personal theological framework by selecting from the vast theological toolbox that has been developed over time, space, and is unfolding around us all the time. At the center of our religious lives is the concept of covenant or the agreements that we make with each other. Many people have heard of our seven principles and that is an example of a covenant. And in our church, actually, we just adopted an eighth principle that is explicitly anti-racist and anti-oppressive. You use value human relationships above all else. We can point to them and know that they are real. So that is where we put our faith uh, above all else. It is not important to us that we all believe or think the same way. It is important to us to support each other and to be supported by each other as we wrestle with life's big questions. We believe that all of us have the ability to determine what is true and best and right for us within the context of relationships. We are a pluralistic, liberal religion, and we are part of the religious left. And I am tired of the discourse about abortion and frankly, everything being the purview of the religious right. And I have struggled with how often and when I really want to say this, but I decided it needs to be said here and now <laughs> the religious right is neither religious nor right. And I'm tired of them. <laughs> I sincerely struggle to understand how a person can make an argument that it is the acceptable role of religion to endorse, or in this case, create a situation that causes suffering, fear, and oppression. That is not what religion is for. And that is what this does. When somebody is unable to pursue a safe and regulated medical procedure to end a pregnancy, there is suffering and fear and oppression and death. Roe did not create the practice of abortion. It made it possible to set safety standards for abortions. The overturn of Roe has been decades in the making from the beginning of Roe. People, the religious right specifically, have been trying to undo this. It has nothing to do with protecting lives and saving children. I do not see the evidence of that. It has everything to do with controlling the bodies of women and trans people. If the so-called religious right was actually interested in protecting children, their work would have focused on increasing access to early childhood education, ensuring paid parental leave, and ending practices that disproportionately incarcerate young black fathers. This has never been about protecting children. It is about enforcing a narrow morality that supports and perpetuates the white supremacist cishet patriarchy. 
And again, I would contend this has nothing to do with religion except that religion is a powerful tool that has been weaponized in the service of that soul crushing death dealing system of power and privilege, the white supremacist cishet patriarchy. And on that note, I want to acknowledge that access to abortion does not only impact women, trans men and other people with uteruses need access to safe abortions too. The case law that was built on Roe gave us same-sex marriage and that is at risk, as are the rights of trans people seeking gender affirming therapies. And the overturn of Roe does disproportionately impact women, especially at this juncture right now. But the thing is that we're all connected. All of humanity shares a common origin and we share a common destiny. We come from one place, we go to one place together. Not just one group of us, all of us together. And under the tyranny of the cishet patriarchy, we are all losers. It might be politically convenient to subjugate women and the queers and the trans folks, but in a worldview of only a narrow few are chosen, nobody wins. It just gets more and more narrow till nobody gets in. And the idea has been wrapped in the trappings of a distorted theology and called a religion, but it is a lie that there is some chosen few. It is a dangerous lie and I just can't abide it. <laughs> as a person of faith and as a religious professional, I will not sit idly by and let that nonsense have the mic. I can't. We all have worth and dignity and love. We all deserve to be loved and to be cared for. And it is our duty to create a world that encompasses everyone, where all people know that they are loved and respected and cared for. And that begins with bodily autonomy. We can't have any of that if we do not have the autonomy over our own bodies. So that's what I am here to talk about tonight. I want to talk about all the things, but that is the thing that I am most interested in and talking about. You know, it's this idea of like who, who gets to have autonomy and who gets to make decisions about their bodies and how we distribute power and the way that we wrap that up in religious language. I'm ready to just, uh, you know, kind of burn it all down intellectually. And I'm really excited to uh, have this conversation here with my partners. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Mandy. You, you could not have segued more perfectly into the question I'll be asking. The first question I'll be, at, I'll be posing for this uh, next segment of our discussion. So we're going to spend 30 minutes now uh, where our three panelists are going to have a discussion framed by um, some questions that uh, they have come up with themselves and also some questions that have been submitted by um, solicited from, from attendees here at the webinar. Um, so the first question is, um, so Reverend Manning has just been speaking about the influence of religion um, on abortion. And so some may be thinking, well, yes, religion religion has a, has a big influence on abortion. So then why is abortion a legal matter? And shouldn't it be an individual's decision to make? And um, so this this gets into areas of, of the separation of church and state. So I'm gonna um, start with uh, with Marilyn. Go to Marilyn first for comments on this. Can you unmute Marilyn? Sorry. Well, you're right, separation of church and state is at the basis of this question. And unfortunately, the constitutional separation that we have thought was pretty firm has been eroded over decades now. And we're seeing more and more religious type decisions being brought uh, into the law and into the courts uh, and uh, the use of public money being used in religious organizations. So we have a blurring that's occurred uh, and it's unfortunate in my opinion, but I do believe that the majority of the justices on the current United States Supreme Court are not 
as concerned about that, that wall of separation as you and I might be. I love that um, phrasing. <laughs> well, and I'll just add, people's religion plays a huge part in all of their medical decisions, especially big life medical decisions. Um, every uh, religion has rules um, that some people follow to varying degrees about death, right? About whether or not they believe in euthanasia, whether or not they want last rites, whether or not they want to be organ donors, whether or not they want to accept blood products, or if they want to, um, you know, anything. Uh, people's religions, their their diet, right? Their, uh, it, it just really, it plays a factor in and everybody who has a religious belief that they hold dear, um, that plays a role in their decision making. And that is fine. That is good. Th that is acceptable. And up until now, um, one individual's religion has not dictated how um, their care is received. Um, I mean, I say that with a little bit of an asterisk because when it comes to um, everything else, <laughs> it's always just based on standard, you know, best practices, except for um, cases of anything having to do with pregnancy, fertility, anything like that, then there have been greater restrictions, but never to the point we are right now where everyone is being forced to live by someone else's religion in making medical decisions. Um, and so that has become just a very weird position to be in, especially as a provider um, to say, okay, I know that you have no problem with this religiously, but these people's religion says you can't, so then we can't give you good care. Um, that is the situation we're in right now. And it's, it's absurd. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I feel like, so the, the idea of the separation of church and state, I, I think is relatively new on the, uh, the, the history of, of the planet. <laughs> it's kind of a, a newer idea that these should not be the same exact thing. Um, and I, I don't know that we're particularly good at it. I think that we, we say we want these things to be separate, but then we're not really sure how to do it because um, as, as Julia said, people's religious beliefs, uh, play into their medical care, it also plays into your decision-making. It plays into your voting and it plays into you as a politician writing something or, or promoting a, a specific policy, right? What we're talking about, I think, when we say the separation of church and state, I think what we really mean is the separation of the institutions of, of church and state. And um, those two things should definitely be kept separate because they're two very powerful cultural institutions who do not think of themselves as being cultural institutions. Uh, and, and therefore can cause a lot of chaos uh, in people's, um, in the lives of other people who are not a part of that, that system per se, because it, it's, it's a tool of enacting, it is a tool that is used to enact violence on people in the name of doing something good, right? And I, I think people, people, that's a very big term, but let's say people um, have a, have the sense that there's some sort of moral decline in the nation and therefore we must do something about it and have found a toehold, right? I think abortion is uh, something that people find to be, uh, it's, it's a thorny subject. Um, it is complicated, it is emotional, and it typically does involve uh, women and female bodies. And therefore it's, a, it's an easy wedge issue. And that's really what we're talking about here is finding a way to gain political power by exploiting a, uh, a minority group that is uh, easy to exploit, right? And to, to very easily say, or to oppress, and to, to exploit an oppression that is easy to, uh, to just get people riled up, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an emotional issue that can gain a lot of fervor, uh, but it, people's religious beliefs will always play into how they write laws and how they vote, and those institutions need to be kept very separate. And I think we've lost the ability to have uh, nuanced conversations about the, those two different things, personal belief versus institution. I think people, they want to simpl simplify things, uh, simplify the topic of abortion and just like, it's either all good or all bad. 
um, or it's, you know, it's an easy, it's, well, if you believe this, then, then there you go, there's your answer. And they don't realize um, how much, again, yeah, absolutely nuance and just very much down to a personal decision-making. Um, none of this is easy or simple at all. So I, I don't, I don't like it when people say, well, that's just what I believe. It's okay. Well, there's a whole lot more to it than that. <laughs> yes. So we, we've, we've established that, um, you know, Reverend Mandy was just talking about how, um, women are definitely, um, one of the groups that stands to lose the most, um, with this decision, um, people with uteruses, trans men and non-binary people. Um, so some of us might be thinking, um, well, what about the rest of us? Or what about people who are not able to bear children or are not interested in bearing children? Um, why should people who are, you know, don't want children or, or can't have children, why should they care about the loss of Roe versus Wade? And Julia touched on some of this, um, some of the the far-reaching effects of the decision in healthcare. Um, but I'm wondering if we could um, go to Marilyn first for a little bit on this idea of what, why should why should those uh, people who don't want to bear children um, care about this this law being overturned? Well, a good many people not of childbearing age uh, are empathetic with those who are, and uh, with with their feeling that they want to be able to control their own bodies. Also, this issue is so, as you both have pointed out, um, so inflammatory and so engrossing that it, there's no question that the attention it will continue to get now uh, will detract from attention to other issues of vital importance, like the environment and human rights. Um, also, as I pointed out earlier, the effect of overturning this precedent of Roe and Casey is is destabilizing to the law in general. It, it, uh, it leaves people uncertain what they can depend on as law in the future in other areas. Um, if this precedent's taken away, if this right is taken away, and this by the way is probably the first time that the court has ever taken away an existing constitutional right. If this can happen to this constitutional right, why can't it happen to other constitutional rights, particularly those involved in the whole area of the right of privacy, um, the right of same-sex marriage, uh, the right of contraception, um, the right to adopt among same-sex couples? Uh, why should those rights not be directly imperiled as a consequence of this decision? Um, I think that it's destabilizing and disruptive of society generally and of the reputation of the court. And we rely heavily on the people trusting the highest court in the land as being impartial and fair and paying attention to public opinion. Clearly public opinion nationwide wanted to, polls have shown, wanted Roe to be retained, did not want it to be struck down. Even higher percentages polls have showed in Michigan than nationwide. In Michigan, the percentage is somewhere between 65 and 67 percent. So Marilyn, how, how long will it be before we get back to a national constitutional right to abortion? We have a, a youngish Supreme Court. And as you know, there's no age limit anyway on the justices in that court. Um, they serve um, for life or good behavior in the words of the constitution. And uh, I don't think any has really ever been removed for bad behavior in the, as the law. I, so it says, in, it says in there that they can be removed for bad behavior. Yeah. I think we've got some contenders. Well, I think it's generally thought to mean uh, something like, um, you know, committing murder or treason or something like that well <laughs> okay so um it doesn't look in short as if we will be changing the complexion of that court uh, for some time to come 
And I think most people in the legal world are ready to concentrate on the state Supreme Courts for um, redress right now in this matter and, and in other matters too, like gun control, for example, um, because we're not gonna get decisions that are favorable to, to, to those of us who believe in those matters uh, in for perhaps even decades to come. So one more, while we're on that subject, one more um, question for Marilyn um, in terms of the law, what, what can people who are concerned about these regressive changes in the law do to help turn them back? I think you started touching on um, state courts and stuff. So what can, what can the voting public do? Well, there's lots the voting public can do. And that's one bright light here, I think, for those who favor uh, the right to abortion. Uh, they can, in the first place, vote on that initiative that I described in November and vote for that. That will pretty much settle the issue in Michigan. Uh, it will settle it for more than just the right to abortion, as, as you could tell from the language that I quoted to you. Um, you can Voters should take careful note of who's running for the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, if we don't... Uh, if we should put in two conservatives on that court, in addition to those who are already there, the balance of power in that court will turn around. There are only seven on that court. There are nine on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, we now have, we being the progressives, have a majority on that court. And if both of the nominees of the Democratic Party are elected, I think you can be sure that um, there we won't have a court that looks at the law the way the current U.S. Supreme Court does. Um, and then there's a the question of our, our congressmen and our legislators. Um, we have it in our power to pick and choose among the candidates. And we've had the gift of reapportionment that now no longer involves atrocious gerrymandering in the state of Michigan. So for the first time in November, we're going to be able to elect um, people to, to the Michigan legislature and to Congress um, on, on, a, on a vote that is more representative of the popular opinion than of a gerrymandered group of, of uh, interests. So there's a lot that we can do and it's really in our hands. Thank you, I, that's, I appreciate that ray of hope. Um, yeah, let's just wrap it up there. Good night, everybody. Thank you. For <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. We've got lots more to talk about. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I've got a thorny one now. Um, this I'm going to combine a couple of questions, one that was submitted ahead of time through our online forum and one that was um, ideas from one that was just submitted in our Q&A. And that's about the idea of personhood, um, the idea of uh, an unborn fetus or embryo as a person. Um, some abortion opponents feel that a fetus is a person um, and that therefore abortion is the taking of a life and should carry the appropriate legal punishment. Um, and following on that, uh, related to that, uh, our question in, in the Q&A box, um, says, could the panelists speak to how they view the notion of legal, medical, and moral personhood as it relates to abortion? From a secular political perspective, the idea of personhood is fundamental to the concept and enforcement of human rights. So um, I guess- I'll start. <laughs> yeah, I'd like Julia to start and talk about, you, you know, talk about the idea of a fetus as a person and what that means medically. And then everyone can chime in about the, the general concept of personhood as, that, uh, as our questioner uh, asked about. Okay, first of all, I've got a kitten that won't leave me alone. <laughs> Hi. So anyway, the idea of fetal personhood is one that is purely based on somebody's um, religious beliefs about a soul, right? The idea of whether or not, you know, something that exists um, is separate and apart from, um, you know, the, the person that's keeping them 
solely alive and that that is a religious question that's a philosophical question it's not a medical question and it's not an ethical question um of a, a zygote um the a, a fetus is solely dependent on the blood literally the bloodstream of the pregnant person they that is their life support literally so abortion is uh, akin to you know, taking somebody off of life support, of hospice, of euthanasia, those sorts of um, things that are very well established in medical ethics. Um, they are not separate. You know, when somebody goes into the hospital, um, the patient is the mother. The patient is not the fetus. Um, and people have tried to point to, oh, well, sometimes there's, you know, surgeries uh, that are done pre-birth in utero, on uh, the fetus, that's true. Uh, the patient is the mother still. Um, you know, the the case for personhood is not a medical one. It is not um, based on anything again other than the idea that um, that a zygote, an embryo, a fetus um, is is its own unique individual. Um, with some sort of soul or some sort of was was created by some other higher power to be there. Um, and and again, if that's your personal belief, then great, that's going to factor into your decision making. But if it's not, um, there is no reason from any moral or ethical standpoint um, that, you know, somebody would not make that decision um, to say, look, I, I, I do not want to continue giving my lifeblood to uh, this growing, you know, zygote fetus um, because I either choose not to or because it's the kinder thing to do um, be, for, for whatever reason. There's, you know, there's so many different uh, thoughts and feelings surrounding uh, the, the ending of any kind of life support, but generally it comes down to, you know, the the enemy is not death, it is pain, it is suffering. Um, and so many times, you know, the, the decision, the key decision that comes down to it is, it is a kinder thing to do um, to take that fetus off of your life support um, than it would be to either continue on um, with that pregnancy, have that delivery, um, and then, you know, deal with whatever negative consequences you were concerned about. Um, and, and that is that decision should be up to every individual to make of whether or not um, they want to continue providing that life force. Um, the idea that 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 a fetus is uh, essentially a zygote, <laughs> a multi-celled organism um, is its own separate and unique person apart from um, the, the pregnant person is, is nothing, is not based in any sort of realistic, um, you know, basis other than a religious one. And again, that's the reason why we should not be making um, any decisions for other people about their bodies based on our own personal religious beliefs. Yeah, that's true. You know, I just feel like the when we were talking about the influence of religion and uh, the, the influence of religion on politics and policy, you know, and um, we should be looking to provide each other with the greatest amount of freedom to make our own choices. If we're into religious freedom in this nation, then we need to be into giving people the most freedom to practice religion as they see fit or not as they, as they see fit, right? Um, it, the idea of religious freedom got very quickly and handily uh, transferred and you know, kind of changed into religious tyranny, the freedom of, of me to enforce this religion on everyone else, not me personally, but a, a different person wearing a similar shirt to put their religion on other, other people, right? Um, we, the idea of when does life start, when does personhood start um, varies depending on who you ask. For some people, it's the moment of first breath. For some people, it might be conception. Um, the thing is, is that when something is up for debate, whether we're talking about something of a religious nature, or in this case, you know, the meaning of life, which I think could be a religious question, 
we need to be giving each other space to make those decisions for ourselves, right? Um, the personhood laws, I think, came around somewhere in the 90s and because it, it was able to get some traction, right? It was, it was a tactic and it worked, you know, and it was throwing stuff at a wall, let's see what sticks. And that one stuck. And so, the, it, you know, I'm, I'm from Texas, right? And so I think this may be the birthplace of, of the personhood laws, right? And then they started to, to catch on in other states, right? And, and spread. Um, what we should be invested in as, as humans is what we can know to be true, all right? And truth can be a little bit subjective. I understand this, but what we know to be true is that a living person may need to end a pregnancy or may want to end a pregnancy. And we know that that person is right there and that that is a person with, with um, you know, a life and with value and with dignity and that that person should be able to make that decision for themselves, that they know their situation better than, than anybody else. Right, and at some point, you know, maybe, I don't know if we're gonna be able to have a whole lot of time for it, but I, I do wanna talk a little bit about, you know, if we're, what, what always struck me as weird and ironic about these personhood laws, like, great, so that's a person, that fetus is a person, does it now have WIC? Does it have Medicaid? Are we going to start, you know, providing it with some sort of TANF? You know, is there some sort of financial support for this, this person? Uh, no, the answer is no, right? Which is, again, another reason why I, I really don't think we can make an argument that this is about children or life. This is about control. Well, and I, I, I want to stop using the word children. Nobody gives birth to a child. They give birth to an infant. You know, people are falsely equivocating, you know, 10 year olds with a zygote. And if you can't tell the difference between a 10 year old and a zygote, um, you really shouldn't even be in this conversation. Um, there's a very big difference between them. And anybody who wants to equivocate the two, again, is making a religious argument or is not making a medical argument or an ethical or moral argument. Um, there is a very big difference between, um, you know, a, a fetus that is completely dependent on, for, for every bit of its existence on the placenta that the pregnant person is, uh, you know, this, first of all, placentas are amazing. They're a temporary organ that it, that you grow um, every time you get pregnant, you want to sustain that pregnancy. Um, and they only last for about 40 weeks and then you get rid of it. And then if you do it again, it happens again. So they're temporary organs. Um, and <laughs> it's just really amazing. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan, by the way, you know, I have four kids. I've been through this quite a few times. Um, so, you know, not to say that, that any of this is like, you know, we like to like to be painted sometimes as being anti-child, anti-baby. No. So using the term children is just emotionally manipulative. Um, and it's not, it's not accurate, um, in any way, shape or form. And, um, you know, the real sad part is that, you know, the, children that we do have that exist in this world are being put through the worst of the worst traumas um, in the name of trying to save future children. Um, and and it's, it's nothing but just emotionally manipulative. It's not medical, it's manipulative. I want to, uh, Julie, I want to jump in and, and while we're on the subject and ask you to comment on another emotionally manipulative term in this debate, which is heartbeat. We all <laughs> hear the word heartbeat being thrown around. Bills are based on, but some bills are called heartbeat laws. There are organizations that use the term heartbeat. Uh, talk to us about that concept of a heartbeat. Sure. So <sighs> cardiac activity um, you know, in fetal development, the heart is one of the most complex organs that exists. Um, so it is one of the things that starts developing the earliest. But when I say starts developing, I don't mean a teeny tiny little functioning heart with four chambers and an aorta and, you know, everything in there and it just gets bigger. What it means is, um, you know, the, the, the very microscopic fibers and tubules and things that will eventually grow to become a functioning organ known as the heart after birth, by the way, 
um, before a uh, fetus is born, the heart is not functioning because it bypasses the lungs. There are huge holes in the heart. If you, if you kind of remember back to high school health class, um, fetuses live underwater in amniotic sacs, right? They're in fluid, um, they're in the waters. So their lungs do not function uh, until they take their first breath. And that very miraculous first breath causes a whole series of things to happen, including over the next few days, those holes in the heart closing so that it, the blood supply doesn't bypass the lungs. So going back to the term heartbeat bill, at you know six, seven weeks or so, a, a very high powered ultrasound can pick up that cardiac activity, meaning those are just electrical pulses that are happening. It's not a heartbeat, it's just the sound the machine makes. A heartbeat is when, like if you hear it through a stethoscope, that love dub is the atria and ventricles contracting working together in rhythm to pump heart or to pump blood throughout the body, right? This is just like little firings of things getting ready to happen. It is not a functioning heart. Um, and, it, and it won't be for, for quite a while. And again, even after it's born. Um, so that use of that term heartbeat that everybody knows, everyone's heard a heartbeat. Everyone's had as you know, heard something through a stethoscope. That is another just completely emotionally manipulative term to falsely equivocate a six week old zygote to a full term newborn. Um, and, and so that again has been used very well, very effectively by anti-choice politicians um, to try to evoke an emotional response and, and draw some logical conclusion that if something has a heartbeat, well, then it's alive. And if it's alive and you stop it, then you've killed it and that's murder. Um, you know, and, and logically, a lot of people can follow that, but it's not true. It's not accurate. Um, and there is absolutely nothing um, that you know has <laughs> that has any merit in saying that it is a functioning heartbeat when it is not. The law has uh, been in Michigan so far unwilling to to recognize the fetus as person, and uh, of course we it's obvious that attempts will continue to be made uh, to to get that to happen. There's a reference in the. Uh, Dom decision that uh, characterizes a fetus as an unborn child and imports the religious views of the Christian right into the opinion doing that. Um, but um, so far here in Michigan, we don't re recognize the fetus as a person and having the rights of a person. And so you can't uh, murder somebody by performing an abortion. Uh, but it's been interesting to me to see as a judge uh, the efforts that have been made and they, they sort of portent what could happen in the future. For example, I remember when a prosecutor in one of the Western part uh, counties in the, in, the, in the state brought an action against a woman for um, transmitting, uh, illegally transmitting drugs uh, to another person, a uh, violation of you know, the, the, the drug laws. Um, she was a pregnant woman who was taking cocaine and the allegation was that by taking cocaine, she was injecting that into her body and therefore it was being transferred to her fetus through the fallopian tube, I mean, to the, uh, through, however, I don't, I'm not sure they specified how it was supposed to be. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that she was therefore transferring drugs to, uh, to a person in, con in, in, in contravention of the law. The court, we found that that was not uh, a, a violation of the law. And of course it was based on the premise that she wasn't transmitting a drug to a person. Well, and just take a look at that case. What was the point? It was to punish that person. It wasn't to help them. It wasn't to help her get drug treatment. It wasn't meant to do anything other than to punish her for being a drug addict. That's it. Well, you know? Just like, you know, and to say, well, here's this like deplorable situation and then to create some case law based on it. 
right? You know, like and make it worse. Let's yeah. just see how far down we can punch. And, you know, we can punch down three times here. We got a, a woman who was using drugs while she was pregnant, right? And then we can use that then to build up some case law for, for later. For Jesus, I just like, it's so diabolical. I'm sorry. I just, like, I, I just, I find it so infuriating that there is so much um, careful decades long sneakery going on so that there can be a moral high ground by somebody. It just, it, it feels like there are actual problems in the world that could be solved. Like if we could get that type of conniving mindset onto, you know, poverty, (laughs) maybe we could create some good in the world. Um, And and it's a problem with you know, anybody who is drug addicted and pregnant, um, you know, I I worked in the neonatal ICU for years. I have taken care of dozens and dozens of babies who were born addicted to everything, you know, and the, you know, drug addiction knows no, um, no limits. I mean, people who, you know, otherwise looking at them, you would have no idea that they were addicted to opiates the entire time that they were pregnant. You would have no idea that they were addicted to cocaine or amphetamines. Um, and, and then some, you would say, okay, that tracks, you know, it, it, it really, it's an equal opportunity issue. And the answer is not to, you know, either legislate it away or, or, you know, litigate it away. Um, it really comes down to the overall, you know, arc that we have the problem of substance abuse and addiction, um, because it affects everyone and people who have substance abuse problems get pregnant. And sometimes it is safer to keep them on those substances that they are chemically dependent on than it is to tell them to stop cold Turkey, because that can have even more devastating effects. Um, and so it's, it's, again, it's, it's just punitive. It is not meant to help better any situation. Um, it is just meant to punish. So we have a little less than 20 minutes left, uh, before we're going to want to wrap up and we are in, into the portion of the discussion. We had set aside this last portion to take questions from the Q and a box. So there, there are a few piling up. So I want to make sure, um, I make space for those and, We have, this sort of segues into what we were just talking about, about personhood. Um, We have a question that asks, what about the unintended consequences of this this decision? If the zygote is now a person, can it be an instant tax deduction for the mother? So Reverend Mandy um, commented on that. Can states now mandate vaccines for all and remove choice from that issue? Um, And then the second, there's actually a, a so that's that's more, I think we've kind of talked a little bit about that, um, but there's two more kind of questions in this submission. What about the idea of increasing the number of justices on the Supreme Court? Is that a possible solution? And uh, speaking of language, how do we take control of it back from the Republican narrative? So um, maybe, uh, Marilyn, maybe you can comment on increasing the number of the justices on the Supreme Court. And then um, maybe Reverend Mandy, you can talk about taking back the language since you were talking about the religious left earlier. (laughs) Right. Uh, Increasing the number has been uh, often termed court packing. And I think we we saw it uh, seriously considered during Franklin Roosevelt's second term in office when uh, the Supreme Court was routinely turning down his his proposed legislation uh, to try to enforce the New Deal uh, and put it in effect. And at a certain point, he became so frustrated with this consistent uh, 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 rejection by the court of his New Deal legislation that he threatened to add justices to the court in such a way as to overwhelm the numbers who were voting against his New Deal legislation. Um, Ultimately, that effort failed. Uh, But interestingly enough, before it failed, the court turned around and stopped and stopped rejecting the New Deal legislation that he was that he was putting before Congress. So although court packing didn't work, 
uh, it did seem, it, it certainly did seem to influence the sitting justices on the court with respect to their views on certain matters. I suppose a threat to pack this court could work out that same way. Um, and the fact is, that if we look back in the history of our Supreme Court, it hasn't always been nine justices. Uh, it's been a, a varying number over a period, uh, the, a long time ago, and uh, it could vary again. There's nothing sacrosanct about nine, although there have been nine for a very long time. And I think the general, the general feeling among people in the legal community is that court packing would be a bad idea because it would be, again, a destabilizing effect on the, on the whole system. So I'm, I would be very surprised if the president were able to um, force it through. Uh, however, the people would have to vote on it. I think that it's unlikely that it would happen. What if you just took out the last two in? Can we just go down to seven instead of trying? Is that bad? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, Reverend Mandy, what about um, the, so narrative. Language, the language notion about taking taking control of this narrative back from the Republican, conservative, anti-abortion side? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I just also, I don't want those things to all be the same. Right, like I miss, I miss the Republican Party as it as it was. You know, I I, I miss a party that was interested in, um, you know, conservation over conservatism. Um, so, like I, I would kind of like for the the reclamation of that to uh, to happen um, and move away from being so extreme. Um, and I, I think that's part of it, right? So, I think it's important for us to be very careful and um, interrogate the language that we use. I appreciate the reframing earlier about child, for example, I had not even thought about that, but yeah, you know, and, and think about how we're using words and try to use them with more accuracy. Um, and I think people, based on the fact that this just happened to me, I'm gonna say that I don't think people think about it, right? I don't think that we think about some of the language that's been handed to us. And so having those conversations of, you know, so I noticed you use this term and I'm wondering, right? I recently learned that, you know, et cetera. And being able to have those conversations, I think is important. Um, the use of language is important. And I also just really want to um, lift up a couple of other ideas. One is that, you know, we don't have to, things lose their power when we give them their proper name. So learning how to use the correct words for things is really important. And then secondly, things lose their power when we tell them that they no longer have power, right? So um, if, if there's a word or a language or a phrase that has gotten away from us and, you know, is being used in a certain way, now what it will always mean, personhood will always mean, like we all know what we mean when we say that, um, you know, not using those words anymore, right? Or just trying to, to find a different way of, of reframing them. There is beautiful... There, there is beautiful language and imagery that is available uh, for the religious left as well. There's a lot of beautiful metaphor that is available there too. And there's a lot of power in just using words in a more plain spoken kind of way, right? So yeah, taking- Conversations is important. Taking literacy into account is huge. Um, one thing, you know, as you use, we prize education, you know, all of us on the panel are very highly educated. We like to use big words and big overarching concepts and, you know, really, you know, we, we talk to each other on, on sort of a different level. The average person in the United States, I mean, they have a fifth grade reading level, you know, and we can talk about how sad that is, but that's a fact. That's, that's why the right has been so good at messaging is because they have understood that and they have come up with those really easy to use and manipulate phrases like heartbeat bill, personhood. Um, you know, somebody asked in there, well, when does personhood start from any medical or ethical standpoint at delivery? You know, when you're no longer attacked, when you're your own person, you know, that that's when personhood starts, you know. Um, but we're terrible at talking about this 
uh, on people's uh, level that they understand. We're really bad about that and we need to get better. Um, we need to use terms that are really, um, like Mandy was saying, you know, easy to understand and repeat. You know, when we're having debates, um, you know, I actually put together a, a bunch of talking points. Um, you know, they have, they have had these talking points and repeated them and rehearsed them. And, and they, they've been doing this for decades. And, you know, I, I think honestly, we've had a failure to respond in any way that is, it is concrete, that is the, on the same level, that is, is easily understood. We've tend to stuck with the same, like, well, body autonomy and, you know, choice and, you know, um, all of these that, you know, we, we, we kind of stick to these same talking points that people are, um, they, they've heard, right. And it's kind of like not really moving the needle. Um, what I would like to see happen is, you know, practice your retort. When people say things like abortion stops a beating heart, you can say that is not medical. That's manipulative. There is no heartbeat, uh, at that stage. You know, when they say things like, Democrats believe in abortion up until the moment of birth, um, on demand up until the moment of birth, you could say, uh, that's not a thing. There are not labor and delivery rooms with like guillotines in the corner, like ready to, you know, chop off baby heads or whatever it is they think that they're actually doing. Like that is repulsive. That's ridiculous. That's not happening at all. Um, you know, using the term, it's just saying, look, no one should be forced to use their organs against their will. Your uterus is an organ. You know, we won't, we don't force anyone else to use their organs uh, in any way that they don't want to use them. Um, you know, so we really do need to have, um, you know, really <laughs> better comebacks. <laughs> I mean, really, there is a lot of just like, like Reverend was saying, They'll just throw anything to the wall, see what sticks, see what they, they have no scruples. They really don't care. They just want to use whatever it is that's going to get them to convince enough people who don't really know what they're talking about, um, convince them to listen to them and to take them seriously. Um, you know, and it's, it's something that we really do need to get better about and, and use as simplistic a term as possible, you know, and use terms that people already understand. People know what hospice is. People know what it means to take someone off a of life support. People understand these concepts, right? And that they are hard, that, that no one makes these decisions capriciously, right? And so making sure that people can understand it is way more like making a decision about hospice um, than it is about cold blood murder, you know? Um, using those terms is a lot, is going to land a lot better. Yeah. Well, and I have to say, I think some of this also is about, um, I, I appreciate what you just said. And I think some of this is also about the difficulty that our culture has dealing with grief. Right. And, and it is a lot easier to just say abortion is terrible and horrible and, you know, condemn, condemn, and then to talk about the complexity and what it's, what it's like for people when they have an abortion and it's sad. And when someone has, uh, when someone isn't able to become pregnant and the, the grief that is there, when someone loses a pregnancy and the grief that is there, right? Instead of just like being able to talk about the nuance and the complexity that can come with such things, it's easier to just push away and condemn and say, this is a terrible, horrible thing. And then, you know, it, it's, it's just or a way again, of weapon. Simplify it, grief. simplify it and say, it's either all good or all bad. And right. nothing is ever all good or all bad. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think that that's, that's, I think that's part of it. And I also just, you know, I think that another thing that, that, that the right has done really well is uh, to pick a few issues and stick with it. Right. Like there, there's been this kind of tight focus on a few areas, including abortion but abortion, I think, is a subset of um, controlling women and trans people, right? And like needing people to fit into a very certain narrative. And then the people who don't fit into that narrative, um, making life harder and harder and harder for, for the rest of us. 
So we have a, a little more than five minutes left before we want to wrap up. So I want to make sure we get um, to all the questions in the Q&A box. Um, there was one earlier on that says, please comment on the risk to the rights of people to use various contraceptive methods that now exists because of the overturn of Roe. So what, what is the risk to, uh, to contraception because of this decision? Well, there's, there's clearly a risk that the law will change. Uh, but right now, of course, it hasn't changed with respect to contraceptions. There, this is one of the matters that, that we're all concerned about because we don't know what with uh, the change in the law that we've seen, how much encouragement the radical right will have in asking the legislature and the, and the, and the courts to make further changes like making uh, the use of contraceptives illegal or um, make it illegal for uh, an ambulance to be used to transport a patient across state lines into uh, a state that permits abortion uh, if Michigan should, should grow into a state that bans abortion. Um, there are all kinds of things like that on the horizon that could happen, particularly if we don't elect the right people, that is to say people to office who share the view of those of us who are, are uh, uh, pro-choice. I think another thing that the, the right and you know, anti-choice people have done is really, um, they're great at their disinformation game. They, they try to blur lines that shouldn't be blurry at all. Um, they make, you know, um, they make statements like, well, this kind of birth control is really an abortifactant, which not a term, um, <laughs> it should ever be used in, in concert um, with anything having to do with what birth control is currently available. Um, there's essentially four types of birth control, including sterilization. Um, there is um, barrier methods, condoms, uh, you know, uh, cervical caps, uh, diaphragms, um, there's spermicides that kill the spermies, um, or just, you know, 86 them. There's ovulation stoppers, like, uh, all of the hormonal birth controls, the pill, the morning after pill plan B, all of those are ovulation stoppers. So there's no ovulation that happens. So spermies can't meet up with the eggs. Um, and there's implantation stoppers like IUDs that make it so a uterus is not a welcoming or um, supportive environment for any potentially uh, fertilized egg to implant. So it just, you know, gets flushed out with the rest of them. That's it. None of the birth control methods that are, that exist cause a pregnancy that has happened to unhappen to be aborted. Um, there are medical abortions. They are a combination of two drugs called mifepristone and misoprostol, m, &M. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't say that, but if you want to remember, it's the, it's the two, unless they start with uh, m, &M. Um, And they are taken um, within 48 hours of each other. So, and this is where those trap laws came in saying, well, if you wanted to get a medication abortion, you have to come into the clinic to swallow a pill. And that was ridiculous. Those are the only two, you know, kinds of pills um, that are meant to induce an abortion of a pregnancy that already exists. Again, people who are opposed to an IUD, because it doesn't stop fertilization, it only stops implantation. So remember, it, the, the spermy and the eggy have to meet up in the fallopian tube and start, you know, separating into multi cells. Um, they go from being that embryo to the zygote. Once it's implanted in the side of the uterus and starts, uh, continue, you know, growing in there. The only, uh, objection to that, to an IUD again, is a religious one because no pregnancy ever starts. Um, but they know that people don't necessarily know all of these things and they have absolutely no problem confusing people, you know, just saying flat out lies, um, because again, they want to control what you do with your body. 
So we've got one last question in the Q&A box, and I think it might be a good one to sort of um, pass to Reverend Mandy, and then Reverend Mandy can um, wrap us up with a pastoral message. So the question is, how can feminist theology help us to understand and respond to this moment? Oh, feminist theology can help us with just about everything. Oh, that's a great question. Um, but the answer is it depends because, you know, no theology is helpful to us unless it has a personal resonance with us. But, you know, my, my understanding and my use of feminist theology um, tells me that, um, that there is love and that there is care for everyone and that there are people who are outside of the systems of power that have been created by humanity. And those are the people who have special favor in the eyes of God. Um, that's really more of a, a liberation theology perspective, but the two were really good, right? Um, the way that the world could be, the world that we dream about was intended to be, what have you. Uh, is not a world in which there are some people who have power and privilege and some people who don't. The world that we dream about, the world as it could be, the world as it maybe was meant to be, is a world that is abundant and has enough for everyone and there's no need to try to convince each other otherwise. We just work together to find more efficient ways of sharing what there is so that all of us are cared for and all of us are loved. And that when somebody uh, breaks those covenants and when somebody begins to try to create systems of power and oppression, then we have conversations about accountability and we name that there was a break in covenant and we talk about how we can get back into covenant together um, because naturally we tend to set up systems that separate us. And so when we start to see that happening, it's time for that conversation of, so this thing is happening and needs to stop. And how do we get back on track with sharing what, what there is? Because there is, there is always enough for everybody. And the idea that we need to, um, you know, break ourselves up into groups where there's some people that have more and some people have less is uh, just rooted in the lie that there's not enough, right? Um, but there is, there always is. So on that note, um, beloved, we find ourselves in a situation that's scary and it's upsetting. And we are touched by grief and anger and fear and frustration um, and worry about what will happen in the years to come and the weeks and the months to come. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that we know how to, we know how to deal with a world without Roe because the world has mostly been a, Ro a world without Roe. And then there was Roe for a period of time. Now it's gone um, and we, we can get it back and we can, do the things that will lead us to a greater justice, right? And we have an idea of what that is because our justice, Marilyn Kelly told us <laughs> that was at the beginning, right? Um, we just now have a more clear idea of the work that is in front of us most directly. This doesn't actually change anything about who we are as a people. It tells us a little bit more about who some other people are and gives us some idea of, of the work that we need to do. Right? We need to take care of each other. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to get out and vote. We need to work tirelessly and not be daunted. This whole thing is set up to make us feel helpless and to make us feel isolated and disempowered. We can't let them win. It's not true. We're not alone. We're not helpless. We're not powerless. We have each other and we have plenty of things that we can. We're gonna get through this and it's gonna be okay. Because it has to be. We don't have any other choices. We can't just stop. We just got to keep going. Thank you so much for coming tonight, everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Reverend Mandy, for that. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Julia, for the discussion. Thank you to everyone who contributed questions, both um, live here in the meeting and uh, beforehand. Um, obviously, 90 minutes is was you know not enough time to get to everything. Um, so I hope that the discussion was um, meaningful, helpful, um, comforting, but also I hope you got riled up too, because as Reverend Mandy said, it's time to be riled up and we're going to need it and we're going to need each other. So thank you all so much for being here tonight um, and have a good night. <laughs>